where we're in a series of uh, spiritual warfare. We did it before Christmas, and then uh, we got into Christmas. And so we had our first two installments of it. You can go to our website and catch up with it. Because uh, how many folks know that we're in a war? Yeah, we're in a war. We really are. We're in a war. There's a battle going on. But I, I think one of the problems is we don't understand the fundamental uh, aspect that we, you and I have to have to win the war. Now, imagine, if you will, can you imagine being, flying in an airplane? How many like flying in airplanes? Okay. If you ever get on the airplane, it takes forever to get on the airplane, right? You get on the airplane. You imagine you're, you're, you're flying and you're trying to, all of a sudden, the, 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 the plane goes into a nosedive, goes up, does a loop, goes upside down. What would you, how would you feel? All right. I mean, it'd be pretty upsetting. We're not, right? And imagine, hello, this is your captain. I just want to let you know we're at 35,000 feet. I just want to let you know that I decided that my instruments are not really true. I'm flying by my feelings today. So enjoy the ride. How many of you be pretty happy about that, right? Can you imagine if, if the pilot, he or she, is, on the, uh, is flying the plane, and you're like, you know what? Ah. It's kind of, kind of limiting to have these instruments. I'm just, I'm going to go how I feel. The problem with that is you could be flying upside down and not even realize it. Now, no one would view that, right? Of course not. You could crash the plane, never get to your destination. But do you realize that our culture today is living that way? There's no absolutes. There's no truth. I do what I feel is the best for me. You do what you feel is the best for you. Can you imagine being in a control tower and every, air, every airline pilot decides to do that? There'd be mayhem and all kinds of chaos, right? Now, <clears throat> uh, imagine if we lived our lives that way. There'd be mayhem and chaos in our culture. There'd be broken families and broken bodies and broken politics and broken entertainment and broken lives. Uh, <clears throat> have you all noticed a broken world, perhaps? You see, everybody, the problem is that you and I need to understand something. There is something called truth, and it is absolute. People say, I don't believe in absolute truth, absolutely. Well, if you say that, you have an absolute that there's no absolute truth. You can't get away from absolute truth because there is truth and it is absolute. I hear people say it all the time. Well, that's your truth. I have my truth. You really can't win. You can't fly an airplane that way. Uh, you can't drive a car that way. I've been in some certain countries. I'm not going to mention any ones in South America that I've been in that uh, everyone does whatever they want to do. I'm driving the car. I mean, it's, just drive whatever side of the road they want to be on, pack people in the back of the truck. It doesn't make any difference. As you're driving through the countryside, there are crosses everywhere, not because they're Christians, because people have died. They drive like their wife's going to have a baby, and their mother is, you know, that's how they drive. And it is chaos. And when you have chaos like that, I'm not going to mention the name of the country. Don't ask me either, okay? I'm not going to tell you what the name of the country is. All right, if you want to know, come to the next service. But if you act that way in life, it's going to be a mess. And we wonder why that life's such a mess in our culture today. Because of truth. Now, what does it have to do with today? It has everything to do with everything if we're going to fight a battle that we're going to win in our life. In fact, have you noticed that almost everything in your life seems like a fight? Now, I've had some of the biggest fights in my world the night before church. How many of you had fights on the way to church? Okay. You guys are lying. Those who are not, you guys are lying. You know how bad it is on the way to church. Some of the worst arguments I ever had in my life growing up was on the way to church. We gave my dad a lot of heaven. Antonym. Have you noticed that almost everything in your life is having a fight? How do you win these fights? How do you win the fights? Well, first of all, in order to win the fights, you have to know the rules of engagement. You just can't do whatever you want to do and think it's going to work out. And so th there's a problem in our culture today, and we, we're going to talk about truth today, the belt of truth. But we're going to talk about that. But I, before we do that, I just want to mention a couple things to you about things that I've been researching. And, and I, I was actually quite surprised. Did you know, according to uh, a new Rasmussen poll back uh, maybe in 2022, that 72% of Americans... This is a surprising. I was kind of encouraged by this. 72% of Americans believe in Jesus. I was like, what? I couldn't believe it. 72% of Americans believe in Jesus. He died for our sins. Isn't that amazing? I thought it was. 
But do you know that only um, 23% of Americans believe in absolute truth? And about 32% of quote-unquote Christians believe in absolute truth. So they believe in Jesus, but only 32% of the church believe in absolute truth. Okay, then who's Jesus then? How many of you heard this? My truth. My truth is this. I even heard it in, the, in the, uh, some debates that we've been having. So one of the candidates said, my truth. And, and this is the problem. I hear people say this all the time. Well, my Jesus believes this. So now what we've done, we've actually made my Jesus. There used to be a, a TV commercial called My Pony. Remember that? My Little Pony. And you could just make the pony do whatever. Now we have my Jesus. So my Jesus says this, and my Jesus says that, and my Jesus does this. And so all I, and you're hearing about Hollywood actors and actresses, like, oh, I'm a, I'm a boy. I believe in Jesus. I, I serve Jesus. I believe in Jesus. And they're having, and then they're on Netflix or whatever, and they're having a sex scene. On, I'm like, what? Oh, yeah, don't be judgmental. That's my Jesus. Well, my Jesus says it's okay to do this. Now, God's not against sex. He created, hello? He put all the nerve endings where they are. Can I hear it? Oh, yeah. Okay, he did, all right? It's made in the proper context, right? I'm not just going against that. God made fun, right? God made wine, hello. Some of you are whiners, all right? So God made all those things, but it has to be done in its proper context, right? And so what happens is we take God's truth and we make it our own. And so now we have a bunch of little Jesuses running around. I call him a dashboard Jesus. See him wiggle, see him giggle. My Jesus does whatever I want him to do. And so what we basically done, we created our own God. So you realize that people criticized the Israelites. And at one time they were in the, the wilderness with Moses and he took them to Mount Sinai, which was the big mountain where he, God met with his people and spoke to them as a, it was an amazing opportunity. And Moses went away. And when he went away, the people were without Moses and said, hey, Aaron, this guy, Moses, we don't know what happened to him. Where is he? They couldn't find him where he was. Hey, make us a gods. Make us gods that we can see. Now, I always thought, I couldn't understand how God could do all the things that he did. You know, part the Red Sea, all the, all the plagues and all that. How could they worship a golden calf? But the problem is this. When Aaron heard the people, they said, make us a god, he was kind of like, I, I better make a god here. And so he, he actually had the people take off their jewelry and melted it down and made a golden calf says, tomorrow we're going to have a celebration, not to Baal, but to God. The Hebrew word for God. So wait a minute. If you were to ask him, who do you, oh, we're worshiping God, Jehovah God. Oh yeah, we're worshiping God. So what they basically did is they made an image of God, what they wanted their God to be. Now we do that today, whether you recognize it or not. My Jesus says, it's okay for me to do this. And so what we've do, we've fashioned our own God, and we call it God. We call it Jesus. But you know the truth of the matter is? We're not worshiping Jesus. We're worshiping our own God. But we call it Jesus. So we do it today. I've done it too. I've made my little Jesus a couple times. Ah, Jesus, you understand Jesus, right? I'm only human. And so we live with this idea that we can pretty much create any God we want to and just call it Jesus. And, and, and that's, why, that's why it's hard to believe that 72% of Americans believe in Jesus, but only 32% believe, evangelicals, believe that the word of God is the word of God. And only 9% of teenagers believe in absolute truth. Hello. So there's no absolute truth. So we're all flying our airplanes, and we're making up our own, own rules. We have our own gauges, and I just fly by how I feel. It's all how I feel. And so now truth is subjective. It's not objective anymore. And even science now is starting to listen to feelings, which is kind of scary, right? I mean, even the very definition of what it means to be a human being is being under question right now, which is insane. And you can see the devastation that's happening in our culture and our world today when people do whatever they want to do. So you and I are in a battle, but the only way we're going to win the battle is you and I need to know the rules of engagement. And we need to know how to fight spiritually. So we've been talking about that. So today we're going to look at what it means. The truth will set you free. If the truth sets you free, what will hold you in bondage? A lie. But the question is, what is truth, right? What is truth? What is it? Pilate said it to Jesus. He says, what is truth? 
And right now, people say truth was whatever you want it to be. You can't be bigoted. You have to believe that, you know what? It's okay. We've evolved. Truth is, a sl- truth is always moving. It's not stable. Now we wonder why our culture is not stable. Pilate said to him, what is truth? The truth will set you free, but what is truth? You know what truth is? I'm so glad you asked. We're going to get into it right now. We're going to look into the battle plan. We're going to show you. We've been looking through the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul has been writing this. We've been going through this almost the whole year. We've kind of chopped it up in different uh, thematic uh, illustrations, but basically we've been going through the book of Ephesians. Now we're at the end of Ephesians, and the Apostle Paul is now teaching us how to fight a battle, a spiritual battle. At the time he's writing this, he's under house arrest, and he's chained to a Roman guard. And I believe he's probably looking at the guy, I got a good illustration here to tell. He took a circumstances that he liked and made an illustration out of it. But this is what he says as he's finishing up Ephesians. He says, finally, which in other words, listen up, guys, everything I told you. So Ephesians is an amazing book of the Bible. Because remember we talked about your identity leads to your destiny. You need to know who you are in Christ. We've been going through that the whole way. Who you are in Christ, who you are in relationships, who you are at work, who you are in the family, Right? And now we're getting to who you are in battle. So be strong, be strong in the Lord. You see, God wants us to be confident and strong, not in ourselves. I'm confident, I'm certain. No, I want to be confidently humble. How can, it, how can that be the case? You're strong in the Lord, not yourself. Pretty arrogant for me to go outside right now in the middle of that, one, one, of that Route 70 and go like this. First of all, I might become pancakes. But if I have a police uniform on, hopefully they'll stop, right? Because I have authority, right? So I have the truth. I'm wearing the truth. And I can be bold and stop in the name of the law, right? Or stop in the name of love. Before you break my heart. Finally, a little Motown never hurt anybody. <laughs> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of your might. No, his might. You see, God wants us to be confident people. We're not so right now, I'm a Christian, I'm afraid of the world. Oh no, we gotta watch out for, don't watch TV, don't do anything. This is cool. Jesus is gonna come back. Let's buy some dried beans and water. Let's just and smell up the place. No, that's not what it's about. What God is calling us to do is to be bold and strong in the Lord. You have a desire to be confident, and so do I. But the problem is we try to be confident in somebody else. God wants us to be confident in him. And the only way that can happen is if we are with him and in him. And we're having the spirit of God through us. So in the strength of his might, put on. You you and I need to be a put on. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a put on. And tell him it's about time. You and I have to put on what God has called us to be. We put on the full armor of God. And so this armor has a lot of symbolism in it. It's a metaphor the Apostle Paul masterfully weaves through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of what it looks like for you and I to put warfare garb on. Put on the whole armor, not just some of the armor. And by the way, the whole Greek tense here is a command. It's put on the whole armor. Not, hey, put on what you want. No, it's a command. You're not working at some employer where they tell you what to do, you can quit. No, you are a enlisted in the army and you cannot go AWOL. You need to listen to the commander in chief. You need to listen to your platoon officer. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Yes, there is a devil out there. We're gonna, we talked about this weeks before. I'm not going to unpack it again. For we do not wrestle against your mother-in-law. For we do not wrestle against your boss. For we do not wrestle against the Democratic and Republican parties. For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the what? Rulers, against the authorities, 
against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He's basically talking about what is going on in the spiritual realm. There is Satan. He's like the president of the United States. I'm not saying he's the president of the United States, but uh, Joe Biden is not in this room right now, but the police officer's outside taking care of traffic and taking care of our church. He's under the authority of the United States of America, right? And so he is a representation of, of the government. So there are demons, demons of broken families, right? Demons of sickness. There's all sorts of demonic activities. And the Bible is very clear about that. You can see in um, Daniel chapter 9 and other places that there are different jurisdictions. Now, we're not going to break it down all right now, but there's all kinds of things going on, which can be overwhelming. Yeah, I suppose. But guess what? You keep following Jesus, you're going to be all right. Now, therefore, how do we, what do we do now? We're in a battle. Take up, since we have all these cosmic forces everywhere, what are we supposed to do? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Are we in the evil day? You know what Jesus says? He says this in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's why we're doing 21 days. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Sufficient is the evil day. So we are living in an evil day. That's pretty much every day. So you can have, you can withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand firm. So you can stand. He says, hey, when you stand, stand again. I'm still standing. Yeah, 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 right? <laughs> Name that tune. I'm sorry, everybody. I don't know. I had too much coffee this morning. Therefore, stand. Therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. There's a belt of truth that God wants us to wear. And let me tell you right now, I had a lot of belt of truth when I was growing up. <laughs> My father gave me a lot of the belt of truth. Oh, yeah. yeah he, he pulled that belt out. Oh, man, and he was, I would run, I'd run for the hills. And we lived in Long Island. There are no hills in Long Island. So yeah, the belt of, now I'm going to talk about that belt of truth. That was a belt of truth. Well, what's the belt of truth have to do with anything? Well, right now, the, the belt holds my pants up. Aren't you glad? My midlife midsection is trying to push my pants down, but the belt's holding it up. Can I hear an amen? amen. <laughs> okay. Can I hear, you need to go to the gym. <laughs> okay. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil door. And having done all you can, stand firm. Stand there. We're having fastened. You have to fasten. And this is an action. Fasten on the belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as the shoes of your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So the first three, three pieces of the armament were, were to keep on all the time. And the last three, you take them at when necessary. The difference. But these first three are important, and they're in the order of importance. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish, all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take a helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. We're going to be talking about this in the weeks coming, but I want to give you the full context. We're going to go back and talk about the belt of truth. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now, I don't know if you've noticed here, but this whole spiritual warfare has to happen in community, not just by yourself. Now, you're going to fight by yourself, but how much better when you and I have each other? We are praying for each other. We are watching out for each other. The only way this works is together. That's why we have small groups. Not to have a program, not to brag how many folks we have in it. We have small groups for an excuse for you to get to know each other, to find like men and men and women to pray for one another and then by the way it's happening I love to see what's happening in our church how you guys are working together as a community you are helping each other out you have someone that you that, how many times I've gotten text messages from my friends just when I needed it the most how many times I've been I've been involved with something I shouldn't be involved when I get a phone call from a friend God wants to connect us to help us to do the right thing but we need to be connected to him and each other in the right way first him and then each other so, perseverance of the saints. So, a couple real things about spiritual warfare. Okay, here it is. Got a little bit of a review. Spiritual warfare is real, and you are in a battle, like it or not. Well, I don't want to fight. Tough, you're in a battle. To do nothing is part of the battle. You know what happens when you do nothing? 
We pay for it. So, the, yeah, you have consequences no matter what you do. So we're in a battle. Spiritual warfare is real, and you are in a battle, like it or not. You see, like what Tony Evans said, said this, spiritual warfare is that cosmic conflict in the invisible, angelic realm that is being waged in the context of the visible, physical realm. So we're seeing, we, the things that are invisible, we're not even seeing. So there's a spiritual battle going on. So spiritual warfare is real, and God is all-powerful and over the devil. There's no yin and yang. It's not like the bad and the good. No, God blows away the enemy. There's no contest. Then why is he allowing what he's allowing? You know, sometime in the near future, I like to ask some of these questions people are asking. But let me tell you right now, God is stronger than the enemy. Everything the enemy does has to go through God. He gives a certain amount of allowances right now, but God is stronger. You don't have to fear the enemy if God is with you. I'm telling you, there's not even a contest. And one of the things that the enemy does, tries to do, either it gets you to overanalyze him. As C.S. Lewis said, there's two equals. You can either be preoccupied with the devil or ignore him. And he's happy with both of those. We have to be sober and know that we are in a fight. So we have God of all the power, right? God of all power and all, um, God of all power is over the devil. And the battleground is the flesh, the world and the devil. So the flesh, that means this stuff, right? That means like my body's telling me to do certain things. Like keep my, my body keeps on talking. My body talks a lot, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right? I don't know about you, but man, when there's a good pizza, uh, my body talks, right? So we got to put our body in subjection. Our body will tell us things. That's a battle we face sometimes, the flesh, the old way of doing things, right? Then we have the world, the world system out there. The world has a whole culture of what they think is right and wrong. Right? And they say what they say it is. And then we have the devil, which is the spiritual foundations that are happening in the spiritual realm. So these are the three battlefields that you, are, you and I are living in, and it all happens right here between your eyes. And there is something called absolute truth. The truth will set you free. What is the truth? Jesus is the truth. He doesn't give you truth. He doesn't show you truth. He is truth. Everything about Jesus is true. We spoke about weeks earlier that the Spirit of Christ holds the universe together, which simply means, and even scientists tell us, there's a universal something that's holding it all together, and it's the Spirit of Christ. Jesus is truth personified. And what we need to do is we need to live in that truth, know that Jesus is truth. It isn't just whatever you want to do, and people don't know the difference between what's true and what's not, right? So truth is an object. A truth is an objective standard by which reality is measured. It's an objective standard, not a subjective standard. Okay? By which reality is measured. It is an objective standard that is a standard that is outside of you. You're not the truth. It is outside of you. It is an objective standard by which you measure the reality of something. The truth will set you free and keep you free. And so what we have going on today is people don't know what truth is anymore. And we call it absolute truth. My truth, your truth, my Jesus, my church, I do what I want to do. We don't even know what's true anymore. As a result of that, we see the foolishness going on in our culture today. I've used this example in the past, but I love this example. I'm going to use it again. I used to work at a camp back when I was a teenager, Camp of the Woods in Adirondacks Mountains, and I met a good friend up there named Paul. His name was Paul. It's Paul, but in Brooklyn it's Paul, okay? <coughs> Paul was Italian. It was an Italian section, right? The best food in the world is in New York City, I'm telling you right now. So we're, um, we're, we go to his house, Paul, and his mother, Joanne, she's, hey, mom, right? It's mom, it's not mom, it's mom, okay? You guys get that? You need to know how to speak the language when you're in Brooklyn. So uh, anyhow, so we're there, and every time I went to his house, his mother was cooking something. There's always gravy on the, on, on the stove, and gravy's tomato sauce, okay? There's little sausages, sausages, it's smelling of sausage, of meatballs. I mean, you go in there, your mouth begins to water, and then she tries to feed you. She try, I, mean, I feel like Hansel and Gretel. What's going on here? They're trying to fatten me up. Sit down, have some. I'm not every, no, please, please, have some, have some, you know? Have some espresso, you know? And, 
I'm sitting there like this and trying to eat everything. So anyhow, but it, it's, it's beautiful. So I go over his house for the holidays. No matter what holiday is, there's meatballs and sausage. It doesn't make a difference what it is. Thanksgiving, meatballs and sausage and turkey. And so he has this, he has this uncle of his that came over the house, and I, it, it was so much fun. I, I grew up Italian, but I didn't grow up in an Italian neighborhood. Italian neighborhoods are awesome. I mean, they're awesome. And then the food, the, the, however one acts, it's fantastic. They all get together. Everyone gets together. Even the mob's there. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. You hear the violin playing. Da, 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 da. Hey, Paul, give me some of this. Anyhow, so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, this smells amazing. And his uncle, I can't remember his uncle's name. He says, I can't smell a thing. What do you mean? Well, I lost my sense of smell. Well, how did you lose your sense? I work at the sanitation department. What is that? I'm an, I'm an environmental engineer. You're his garbage man. Okay. So nothing wrong with that. He got paid a lot of money, by the way. So I can't spell anything. Why? Because I am in New York City for about 20 years now, and there's all the maggots sit down, and, and the rats, let me tell you, the rats are about this size. He starts going on about the city rats, and oh, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And he says, you know, he's, I'm there so long, that I can't spell anything anymore. I, I, I can't smell anything at all. I told my wife, it's not my fault. I can't spell anything. But I could taste things, and this tastes good, you know. So he told me how good things taste, but he can't smell a thing. Why? Because he's been, he's been what? His olfactory senses have been destroyed because of all the garbage is out there. He doesn't have a discerning nose anymore. He can't tell what something else is anymore. Listen, everybody. We have a culture today that calls everything truth. And if you're not careful, you and I live in this cesspool of the world system, our sense of right and wrong gets pretty skewed. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, 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 things are going on in our culture today. I mean, it's like everyone's using the F-bomb constantly. I mean, even the presidents, the, the, everyone's using them, right? Everyone's talking trash about each other. And it's like a normal way of life now. You know, I use the F word all the time. I believe in faith, family, right? And forgiveness. Those are the F words we should be using, not the other ones. And so we got this going on. We have culture standards going down and everyone does what they want to do in their own eyes. There's a book called Judges that where every man does what he wants to do in his own eyes. That's what we see happening on. And so what happens if you're not living in truth, you can't discern what's right and wrong anymore because our olfactory senses of morality have been, has been polluted by the world. In fact, we become like cucumbers that become pickles. Now, why am I talking about pickles? Let me talk about pickles for a few moments. How many like cucumbers? Okay, I like pickles too. What do you do with a pickle? You eat it. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do with a cucumber? If you want a cucumber to become a pickle, what do you have to do? You got to pickle it, right? Pickled eggs, pickled pig's feet, okay? It's fantastic, okay? So what you do is you take, the, you take the cucumber, you put it in dill, you put it in garlic, you put it in vinegar, you put all, uh, uh, all these spices in there, and you, if you dip a cucumber in pickle juice and take it out immediately, you might taste a little bit on there, right? But you wash it with water, it's still a cucumber. But if I keep that pickle in there and shut the lid, and it sits for days and days and days and days, what happens to that cucumber? It gets pickled, now, the basic environment in which it's created tastes like a pickle. Now, aren't you glad you came to church today? You learned about pickles. <laughs> They're really good on chicken sandwiches, by the way, but that's beside the point. So what has happened to us is this. We've been pickled by the world. We are in our environment. And by the way, we can make our own. This is what we all do. I have my Jesus. I have my truth. So what I do is I get a little jar, and I put the spices of the world I like in there. A little garlic, a little this, a little the other. And I drop my mind in this pickle juice. I know people that are being pickled by all kinds of nonsense. For example, I know people that have a college degree and a master's degree. And they've been pickling their mind in conspiracy theories. They don't believe it. They're always on the internet. And, 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 and I kid you not, I'm, I wish I was making this up. People that I know, not one in this church, they believe the earth is flat. I don't know what school they went to, but they, they believe the earth is flat. Okay? Why? Because they're pickling themselves in their own silo. And the problem with the internet, or the internets, as some of you like to call it, what happens with the internet is you can make your own ecosystem and make your own pickle juice and put yourself in there, and you can create your own spices, and you can find anyone else that believes what you want to believe. 
Now, the problem with this is, if you are so pickled, you can't tell you're in a pickle. You can't tell anymore. I'm very concerned when a lot of us are, are filling our jars of our minds with conspiracy theories all day long. People sending me stuff that's nonsense, right? And you fill yourself with all these lies. You may be loving Jesus, but what happens is when your mind gets pickled, you can't tell what's true and false anymore. The enemy loves the fact that we watch the news all day long, that we watch all these podcasts of these people that think they know what they're talking about, right? After all, you do know those aliens under the, uh, under the White House. You know that, of course, right? And you believe all this stuff, you get pickled in your mind. Well, how do you get unpickled? You take the pickle out of the pickle juice. And you need to put it in fresh water. We need to get our minds clean. The Bible talks about the water of the word. We need to know that there is absolute truth. There is an environment of truth. And if we're not careful, we get pickled by the world. So we have to get out of it every day. Make sure when you're in the world, you need to take yourself out of the world and get into the word. I can't imagine trying to run my life without reading the Bible every day. I would never be here right now if I did that. It doesn't work for me. I need every day to take myself out of the pickle of the world and drop it in the clear, fresh water of the world, of the word, to get the world off of me. I think most of us take showers here, I hope, and baths. Well, every day you need to take a shower in the world or you're gonna start stinking. I'm telling you the truth now. All right. Jesus said this. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now that's pretty bigoted and small-minded. Yeah, I guess it is. It's also bigoted and small-minded to tell you if I take you up to this roof and say, you can't jump off without breaking your leg, well, that's kind of small-minded. It's the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. He doesn't show the truth. He is the truth, right? He, he is the way. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, what about people never hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ? What happens to them? All I know is this. Every person has to go through Jesus. He's the only assurance of salvation. I don't tell who goes to heaven and hell. That's not my job. My job is to tell you there's a judgment coming. My job is to tell you get right with God. My job is to tell you that Jesus is the only way. My son was asking me this question the other day. That doesn't seem fair to me. And I, I used this example, and I said, hey, listen, we know there's parts of the world right now, they don't have clean drinking water. And so we support ministries that dig wells. And so these unnecessary diseases, people have a shorter span of life and they get sick and all kinds of problems because they have drinking unclean water. So what do we do? We go over there, we dig a well, and we give them clean water. And we solve a lot of their problems. So there are people in the world today that are drinking from a false well of religions that are false and ideologies that are false. So what's our job? Our job is to go to dig the well and let them know the true life, true source, and let the water bring them healing. But I do not determine who goes to heaven and hell. All I will tell you, Christ is the only assurance of salvation. And our job is to dig the wells of the Spirit all around the world. That's what he's called us to do. I'll let God judge the people. That's not my job. Neither your job. The problem we get, we try to act like God. And the world's like, they're not God. And they reject us. Start being, let God be God. And tell people what the Word of God says. And let God be the judge. Does that make sense? All right. That was a little, that was a little side note. Now back to what we're talking about. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he talks about the devil. He says, you are of the devil, which was the church of his day. And your will is to do the, your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. When you and I choose to live in lie, we all lie. We all do it. When you and I choose to stay there, we are following the father of lies instead of, the, instead of the, God the father. We put ourselves in that pickle juice. And so God wants us to live in truth. Now, how do we live in truth? How do we win the battles? How do we win? The good news, you can win. You can win over sin. How? How do we do it? Well, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. The Bible says take up the whole armor, not just part of the armor. Now, we're going to focus today on this. Okay, to, that you may be able to withstand it in the evil day, having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth. What is the belt? This is me, by the way, last year before I got a haircut. <laughs> so here you have a, a guy, all right? And he's got a Roman outfit on. This is the, it represents the Roman, the, the Apostle Paul was talking about the Roman armament. 
There's a lot we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, but very interesting how it all works together. Underneath this is a tunic, and this tunic you wear above, above you, keeps you keeps everything in place. Then you take the belt, and the belt holds the breastplate, it holds the loin cross, it holds it all together. It's very important. This is the central area, and if you're going to put on a, without the belt of truth, the armor is all over the place. You can't move. It moves around. It makes you, it encumbers your movement. You need truth to hold it together. Okay, so you have the breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, um, gospel of peace. So this would be like the belt of truth, something my wife would wear, a belt of truth here. And in the belt of truth, you have these little hooks. And what you'll do is you'll put the breastplate on and you'll hook that onto the belt. And in the belt there, you have the loins. You know what loins are, right? Don't, don't mind me explain what those are, okay? When my kids play baseball, they have to wear a what? A cup, right? Yeah, I want, son, you're going to wear a cup because I want grandchildren, okay? So that's why we have the loincloth here, right? So it protects the very sensitive area. So you wear the belt of truth. And so what happens is the Roman armor, you put the belt of truth on the tunic, and then you start fastening the breastplate of righteousness and, and, and the sword and the javelin. All these things are put on the belt. It's like Batman's utility belt like Adam West, remember him, okay? So you put all the various things on there like that. And so it holds it all together. And so what they'll often do, you hear people say, gird up the loins of your mind. And so what you'd have to do in battle, sometimes you'd take your, your toga, whatever it is, and you would, you would actually tuck it under your belt so you have greater movement. When you and I tuck our garments of our life in truth, we have greater movement. You would know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so this was a central command center of everything. You had to have the belt of truth. Without the belt of truth, you cannot go forward. So you get the idea here. So the truth is a central part. The truth will set you and keep you free. Are you wearing your belt of truth? We have to fasten it on us. It holds us together, all right? And so uh, some of you wear suspenders. That's okay, but we need a belt of truth. And so we put the belt of truth. Well, how do you handle truth? Well, let me show you how it works. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We're not, it will set you free. Legalism is facts used as, manipulated, as a manipulated weapon. The facts don't set you tr uh, free. Truth sets you free. What's truth? Truth is facts. This is what biblical truth is. Facts plus Jesus equals truth. Why is that? Because Jesus is the truth. We also believe all truth is God's truth because God made truth. We're not afraid of education. We're not afraid to learn. We're not afraid to go to school. We're not afraid of inventions. We're not afraid of study. We're not afraid of investigation. Never be afraid of investigation because God is truth and his truth will stand. Truth has a wonderful way of always winning eventually. So legalism is facts used as manipulating as a weapon. So what do we do as the worship team makes their way up, okay? For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And the word destroy there in the Greek means to destroy. It means like a linebacker will grab somebody, bam, and throw them to the ground. It means breaking apart. It means dislodging. It's a violent action. We need to destroy. Now, I'm not talking about violence in the natural realm. I'm talking about violence in the mental realm. For the weapons of our warfare, not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Ways of thinking and habits of thinking can happen very easily. We destroy, what? Arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Well, she's not showing me enough affection anymore. I need to be shown affection. I need to be happy. God wants me happy. Therefore, I'm going to flirt with this girl. I'm going to talk to this person. I'm going to click on this. And you hear that. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. No. What God has joined together, let no man put us under. No, God, I am not going to divorce my wife. I'm going to work this out in Jesus' name. And you take that thought and you throw it to the ground because the truth is my God gives me everything I need. You see, when you want to lie, no, I will walk in the truth. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. God doesn't care about you. No, God said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. What do you do? You take, that, uh, you take that lie and you throw it down. 
and you have to get violent. We destroy arguments. And when it tells you, when people tell you various things about you that are not true, what does the word of God say? The word of God is the standard. And by the way, the word of God, the Bible, is our final authority. The problem we're having in our culture today, that even the church, even the church, only 32% of the evangelical church believe in absolute truth in the Bible. People think the Bible is a smorgasbord. They think it's a, a buffet line. But actually, the Word of God, the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, supernaturally, God worked through history, worked through men to put this together. It is a supernatural book. I can tell you right now, there's no other book like it on the planet. I studied it for years, not just me. We did a series on the Bible, why you can trust the Bible. The Bible is truth. It is the Word of God. And it's the way we are to live our lives. It is the belt around us. If you don't have a belt around you, you'll have chaos. You'll be like that pilot that's flying around doing whatever he or she thinks. You need truth. You need the right. There's right and there's wrong and there's truth. And Jesus is the word that became flesh. So when you read the Bible, you're reading Jesus. So I want to encourage you that the Bible is true. There are ministries today that are saying we need to decouple ourselves from the Bible. Well, you know, the Bible says, no, the Bible is our final authority. What the Bible says is true. Oh, it's a bunch of guys got together. No, you, you don't write something like that with a bunch of guys getting together. Believe me, I've seen what guys do when they get together. The Bible's amazing. The more I read it, the, the depth of the Bible, the historical thing that took place, the spiritual lessons that are embedded in there. The symbol, I mean, it's, it's amazing. There's no way any human being could put the Bible together like God did. All scripture is God's word. And so we shared about that. So the question is, are you gonna put a belt on or are you gonna take your belt off? Can I just close with a, with a funny story? I think it's funny. My dad, dad if you're watching, uh, did a sermon a number of years ago in New Haven and he had the kids up there. He was talking about spiritual warfare. Talking about the belt of truth in a kid's sermon. And what he did, he said, hey, everybody, I got Bermuda shorts on. Just want to let you know. So he's talking to the kids, and he starts running, and he has no belt on, and his pants fall down in church. And he has shorts, not boxers, shorts. I mean, short shorts. Not short shorts, but shorts. <laughs> so anyhow, he, he illustrated everything falls apart. You can't, you, you end up tripping. There were some people in the church that didn't like my father. And they called the district office of the Assemblies of God. And this is what I quote. The pastor dropped his pants in church in front of children. Can you imagine? I thought that was funny. But anyhow, what does it have to do with today? Nothing, just a funny moment for a second. But all kidding aside, you take your belt off, you will your pants will drop to the floor. You'll trip. You and I need the belt of truth. Listen, we don't design truth. Truth is truth. And we got to get out of the pickle of the world and put ourselves in the clean water of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to listen to the instrumentation of the Bible and not make up our own dashboard. And I'm telling you right now, I, the word of God is true. How, how are you with Jesus? Are you worshiping Jesus or do you have your own Jesus? If you have a dashboard Jesus, you're not worshiping Jesus. You're worshiping a false God. You're worshiping a molten calf. And one day, God's going to say, uh, I don't know who you are. But Lord, I preached in your name. I did, and I don't know who you are. Get away from me. You see, there's only one name which we should be saved. It's Jesus. And we don't make Jesus. Jesus makes us. There is absolute truth. It's called Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you that you are the way, you're the truth, and you're the life. And Lord, I ask you to forgive us for allowing ourselves to get encumbered in things that are not true. Lord, we just today, we choose, Lord God, we choose today, Lord, to believe your truth because you are truth. We choose this day, Father, to bow down to you and not our thoughts and not our feelings. And Father, we ask today in Jesus' name that we would learn who you are and that we'd listen to you, Holy Spirit, that we'd align ourselves to you, that we'd position ourselves to become more like you. In Jesus' name.